Okay, we've reached the golden hour here on usfdons.com and joined once again by USF men's basketball head coach, Todd Golden. Coach, thanks for jumping on today. We got a fun topic, I think. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you, Vinny. Hope, uh, hope you've had a good week and uh, I'm excited to talk about the schedule a little bit. Yep, yep. Before we get there, don't forget, this is our fifth episode. So if this is your first time joining us, head to the USF Dons Athletics YouTube page. Go ahead and check the others out. We've covered roster building, in-game strategy, analytics, more. So check those out uh, when you get some time. Now, Coach, uh, you mentioned we were going to talk scheduling. We're mid-June. There's already been some buzz around your team and the non-conference schedule you're going to play. So no further ado, how about we talk scheduling in college hoops? Let's do it. So with full transparency, Coach, I'm really excited about this topic because my knowledge of scheduling boils down to this. Here's when we're playing. Here's who we're playing. And now how do we get people to come watch the team? So I'm going to wager a guess here. It's probably a little more than that. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's quite a bit uh, more complicated than that. Um, it's, it, you know, honestly, I, I look at it as one of the more underrated uh, parts of a running a college basketball program where you can impact wins and losses and uh, be really, you know, organized and, and have a real plan in terms of, you know, the type of opponent you're playing, when you're playing them, uh, you know, and being in our league, it, it's a little tricky because we play, you know, with an imbalanced schedule, we play only 16 league games and a lot of the other really good conferences across the country have gone up and they play, you know, between 18 and 20 league games. So we have to fit in 15 non-conference games between the start of the season, which is about November 10th, uh, right after Christmas, because our first league game is uh, December 31st this coming year, I believe. So it's a really tight time frame, and it turns into a little bit of an NBA-type schedule where you're playing two or three games a week, uh, trying to separate them so you're rested and, and ready to perform. You don't want to play too many games back-to-back, -back, but then again, you don't want to go too long without playing games. So it's, it's a balance. It's, it's difficult. Uh, Coach Jonathan Sapphire and I work hand in hand. He does a really, really good job of finding good opportunities for us. And, uh, you know, we, we just try to do our best to give our guys the best chance to, to have a good non-conference going into the season. There are definitely a lot of pieces of what you just said that I want to try and pick apart. So, so let, let's get into that. And you mentioned the unbalanced schedule with the, the quantity of, of conference games in the WCC. So e just easy start. Are there minimum and maximum number of games that you're allowed to play? Yeah, so, you know, in Division I men's basketball, you can play what, what equates to 31 games. Uh, it's really 20 it, – it'll be 29 plus 2 going into next year, which basically you can play an MTE, which is a multi-team event tournament, uh, as one of those contests, and you get a couple extra games because of that. But most teams play 31 games. So in our league, having 16 league games, that obviously leaves 15 in the non-conference. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the leagues are going the other direction. They're playing more league games. And, and not having as many opportunities out of conference. So uh, we, we'll, we'll always get to that 31 number because obviously we want to have the most opportunities to get wins that we possibly can. So you have to figure out 15 non-conference games every year. How far out do you need to schedule those? It's, uh, you know, it, it could be a couple years out, to be honest. And, and, you know, there's different agreements that you can get into. You know, there's home and home games where – you might play in one venue one year and then you return the game to your opponent's venue the next year. Sometimes you play two, two for ones, you know, we're finishing up a two for one this coming year with Cal where obviously we played there two years ago. They came back to war Memorial this past year. And then next year we'll finish it in Berkeley. Uh, so, you know, in situations like that, you have games that are on your, on your calendar two to three years out. Sounds like there are a lot of moving puzzle pieces <laughs> when it comes to scheduling. Do you think it's an art? a science or both? I think it's both. I, I think, uh, again, it's one of the areas that we try to use our analytic tools to, to find which games are, are best and uh, evaluate our opponents. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a lot of work. It's, uh, it's something that you have to focus on every day. It's, if you don't look at it, you're, you're gonna fall behind. There's constantly teams that are out there looking for different games and different opportunities. Uh, and once we get to the MTE, our multi-team event for next year, I'll kind of talk about how that all works. Um, but it, it's, uh, if you focus and concentrate on it, you're generally going to be able to put yourself in a situation to, to have a good schedule. And if you don't, you might end up, you know, with, with a schedule that you're not, not very happy with. So in the past, it was all about the RPI, right? And now all we hear about is the net. Um, what is the net and how much consideration do you give it when you're building a schedule? 
So it's a great question. Uh, and the reason why it's a great question is because the net is uh, just an evaluation tool that the NCAA is using to evaluate teams. Uh, there's, it's now only two parts. In year one, it was five parts. Um, you know, so there's, you know, we, we are still trying to figure out exactly what the net is and how it's weighed and different, uh, you know, variables that are put into it. And so we, we, we use it. Um, we're, we care about it. We're trying to find ways, uh, for lack of a better term, to game the system, to, to play games that give us the best chance to get a higher net, because obviously our goal is to play in the NCAA tournament. So, uh, again, we're, we're ahead of the curve there, I believe. And uh, our schedule is definitely uh, put together based upon trying to achieve the best net ranking or the best Ken Palm ranking, because that's how teams are evaluated at this level. Take us a little bit deeper into that. What gives you a good net or Ken Palm ranking? So the long story short, you know, how you perform in a certain game based against how an average division one team would perform. So if an average division one team, granted there's going to be 356 teams in division one next year. So let's just for the sake of this conversation, say how would the 180th best team perform in this given game and say they, the 180th team, would be a five point favorite, or they should win by five points, okay? If you go into that game and win by five points, then your net's gonna be right around 180, right? And if you win that game by 10 to 15 points, your net's gonna be a top 100. If you lose that game by two, then your, your net's gonna drop. And you know, we had a couple of these situations last year, uh, you know, hate bringing back bad memories, especially for myself, but you know, when we lost up at Portland, our, our net dropped quite a bit. It dropped 15, 20 spots, and we really had to work our way back um, to get into the top 100, top 90, top 80 by the end of the year. Uh, but these, these games can really sway one way or the other. And, uh, you know, it, and it, it works in a way where, for example, when we uh, lost to Gonzaga by home, at home by four, our net went up because the quality of the opponent was so high that an average team would have probably lost that game by 10 to 15 points. So there's a lot of different uh, pieces to it. But the easiest way to understand it is your net is determined on how you uh, – compared to what an average team would do against your schedule. Do home games, road games, neutral games affect uh, how the net moves up and down? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, that goes back to that pregame expectation. Uh, if you're supposed to, you know, if you're a home team against a certain opponent, you're probably going to win by, let's just say you're going to win by three. And if you play that game on a neutral floor against that opponent, that's probably an even type expectation. And then if you're going on the road against that opponent, you would probably be expected to lose by three. So there, you know, there's a, home, a big home court advantage. Uh, so the net takes that into account. So when you go on the road and win big games, you're, you're giving yourself a big, you know, a big jump in certain, certain aspects. But really, if, you just, if you're consistent and you win the games you're supposed to win and then you beat good teams, you're going to end up with a good net. So you got home court advantage probably leads to more wins. You got road games where if you perform better, your net goes higher. Yep. How do you balance that? It's, it's the everlasting question, my friend, and, uh, <laughs> that Jonathan and I talk about all the time. Uh, you know, we have a game or two left to finish for this coming year. And we're, we're being really picky in regards to what games we want to play because we know that every game matters so much in regards to our chance to, to play in the tournament next year. So uh, we're weighing all of our possibilities. Uh, you know, we have a couple of really good options out there, but we're going to be really patient and make sure that the last couple of games fit with the rest of the games on our schedule. You mentioned that sometimes you'll get two for ones in home and homes, right? Where you're on the road for either two thirds of it or half of it. We also know college basketball can have some fluctuation in the roster type, seniority, et cetera. Does that play a factor in when you set, okay, we're going to be on the road for this year? 100%. You know, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure how many people spend a lot of time thinking about that, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we're looking to schedule uh, just, let's just say a home-and-home home series, we're, we're going to go and look at their roster and see how many upperclassmen they have. Let's, you know, see how long their head coach has been there, what type of success they've had over the past couple of years. Uh, we're going to, you know, take a look at what they're projected to be this coming year. Maybe they added a few transfers or they added an impact freshman that hasn't been accounted for yet. But, yeah, absolutely. All, all these things are taken into account. Maybe, you know, we'll look and see how that team's performed on the road in the past couple of years. Have they been better on the road than at home? Vice versa. Uh, so, that, yeah, there, there's a lot of different things in that perspective that we look at. Okay, you've mentioned MTEs a couple of times. Uh, I know I'm excited to talk about these. I know you have some exciting ones on tap this year. 
starting broadly, what is an MTE and, and how do you get in? Yeah, so it, it, as, as we talked about earlier, it's there, you have one game uh, reserved on your schedule that you can use at, in terms of the multi-team event. So that one game turns into multiple games. In the past, you've been able to play up to as many as four games as part of it. Now it's going to be three. And uh, basically, it's, it's, you have to just work to find great options. Uh, you know, and, and Coach Sapphire deserves a lot of credit because I had him every day uh, reaching out to ESPN, reaching out to different organizations that have these multi-team events under their umbrella and just promoting ourselves. Hey, you know, we, we, have, we have a team that we think has a chance to be really good next year. We think we'd be a great addition to your event. And so we were working really hard. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we did a great job in terms of uh, getting into the MTE at the MGM Grand uh, right around Thanksgiving this coming year. So which, which teams are going to be in that? Tell us a little bit about that, that event. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible event put on by BD Global, uh, a company that has run these events for quite a while. Actually, in my time at Auburn, we played in this same, the MGM main event, the same event uh, four or five years ago. And, uh, you know, it's just a great opportunity for us to get really quality games on neutral floor. And that's something to be transparent is just really difficult for us, uh, you know, because we're a really good program, um, but we're not quite top 25, top 30 yet. So we, we're in that we're in that zone right now where, you know, college basketball teams know, you know, the coaches know that, you know, USF's a good program, but man, like maybe it's a game we maybe don't want to play. So for us to go to the MGM, uh, as a part of this MTE and get a chance to play Arkansas on a neutral floor will be a great opportunity. I, I project Arkansas to be a top 20 team this coming year. Usually it would be really difficult to get a game like that for us. And now we get to play them on a neutral court where I'm sure they'll travel some fans, but I think we will also, it'll be a shorter travel for us. And now we get a crack to be the top 20 team on a basically a level playing field. Something that's really, you know, we get that in league a little bit with Gonzaga and last year, BYU and St. Mary's, but, they're hard to find. So to get that game and then depending on the outcome of that game, play either the winner or loser of Louisville and Colorado State, it's another opportunity for a great game. And those are the types of games that you want to get on your schedule if you really want to give yourself a chance to play in the NCAA tournament. What kind of prestige do MTAEs give you? Uh, you know, I think it works both ways. You know, you have, to, you have to do well first before some of these tournaments will, will take you as a serious candidate. And then – when you achieve and play well in those events, then the other events will start, you know, knocking on your door about, oh, wow, San Francisco knocked off Arkansas if we're so lucky to do so. Uh, I think they'd be great for our field next year. So then we'll start getting more options to play in different events down the road. But, uh, well, you know, we'll continue every year to work really hard to get in those really good events because, again, just a great opportunity to showcase ourselves against usually high major opponents. And uh, when we do well, it gives us a great chance to be successful. So you're in the MGM MTE this year, and you mentioned that, that you had Sapphire looking for a couple of different ones. Um, did you have a, a couple to select from? Yeah, and, and there's, you know, there's a bunch of different ways you can use MTEs. You know, I prefer doing the neutral tournament setting. Uh, our first year here at, at San Francisco, we played in the Diamond Head down in Hawaii, and that was just a wonderful event. You know, we beat Utah in the first round. Then we beat Illinois State and lost to San Diego State in the, in the championship game. It was a great showing for our program. It gave us a lot of momentum uh, and, and everything from fan support, recruiting, things of, those, of that nature. And I, I think those are the best uh, that you, that you want to be a part of. Um, but then you go – you can also do an MTE at home, you know, where you really in turn are just buying games, um, you know, what we call guarantee games, but you're buying a few games under the umbrella of an MTE so you can play multiple games – uh, at your home venue. You can do that. So, you know, a lot of the high major teams are now going to that model where they're just hosting the MTE on their home floor. Uh, but we, as long, you know, for San Francisco and for our program, again, these neutral event uh, tournaments are definitely the way to go for us when we can find good ones to be a part of. Now, you mentioned high majors a couple of times and the difficulty in scheduling those. So, I mean, I feel like just from an outsider's perspective, you would think, oh, USF would play Cal and Stanford every year. Because, you know, they're right there. They're in each other's backyard. But kind of like at the beginning of this, I feel like it's not quite that simple. So um, what's it like to try and schedule those high major opponents? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's transparently not that simple because you, they're not always willing to play us. You know, I think uh, we'll take a look at Cal here. We'll finish it up this series. For example, Stanford, uh, we had a three-game series with them that we just finished at their place last year. And obviously we were aggressively – 
attempting to re-up that, that rivalry game, and they just weren't willing to play us. You know, you take a look at Cal, and uh, I, I hope that Coach Fox will be willing to continue the series after this year. Uh, we'll, we'll see. You know, I think it's, a, it's an expectation, and, and a lot of the times for the high major programs, you know, those are games that are tricky for them because they know we're good, and they don't, you know, it's a, it's a game that on paper they're supposed to win, uh, but, you know, we've beaten Cal the last two years. So uh, I think it's, it's a little more tricky to find those games. Uh, we're, we're being more flexible in regards to our willingness to go on the road, uh, you know, to, to play games that other opponents might not be willing to play, uh, and, and just to get in that arena to play some of these opponents. And uh, we'll, we'll always try to play as many high major opponents as we can in the non-conference. We have a couple more this year, obviously. And, uh, again, what, more than anything, what I think it really does is helps us get ready for conference play, uh, you know, playing those types of games. Do you have anything in your back pocket that you can use when you're negotiating with uh, high conference teams? Um, again, I, I just think the best thing that we have going for us is that we're a quality game. We are a quality opponent. Uh, we would have been a quadrant one uh, game for most teams this past year, quadrant two maybe for teams at home. So – it's these games are respected. I think the, the committee really appreciates when teams play quad one, quad two games. So for a high major team, you know, when they might be looking for what they call a guarantee game, a win, they might be wanting to schedule somebody uh, that would be a quad four opponent because they just want to guarantee a win. So we have to, you know, we have to find the right team that's looking for a challenge um, that respects, you know, what we're doing and respects that we have a lot of momentum going in regards to, you know, the trajectory of our program. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to find enough that understand, and we'll continue to do it every year. So we talked a lot about the perspective of San Francisco. You also, in your coaching past that we've referenced, um, worked at Auburn. Yeah. You know, what's scheduling like at that level in the SEC compared to the WCC? It's, it's a lot different. It's a lot different. Um, mainly because in the SEC, you know, first of all, they have a lot more teams in their league. So they have a lot more opportunities, you know, for, and now with the net, you know, quad one and quad two is something that you hear a lot in terms of, we, you need a lot of games in, the, in those different quadrants. Well, for Auburn in, in the SEC, they're going to get, you know, say they play 18 league games, they're going to get, you know, 11, 12 opportunities in those quads just on their normal schedule. Whereas in our league, you know, we have Gonzaga, BYU, and St. Mary's. And outside of that, uh, there, there's not going to be many quad two opponents uh, potentially only quad three and then some quad four. So Auburn isn't as uh, – it's not as important for them to go get those quad one and quad two opportunities in the non-conference because they're going to get them in their league. So they – you know, a high major in that perspective is going to go and try to get more games, whether it's to build their team up a little bit, uh, you know, to get guaranteed wins, and they're going to go play low major opponents for the most part. So – we are trying to find those high major opponents while those high major opponents are trying to find low major opponents. Well, we're an elite, you know, mid-major to, to low high major program right now. So we're, we're kind of in that tough spot. But again, uh, we do what we can. And I think each of the past couple of years, we've done a really good job building the schedule out. So we talked a little bit about the schedule this year. We haven't mentioned the first game on the schedule yet. And I feel like that bears mentioning here, Ed. Be hosting Iona College, uh, the new home of Rick Pitino. Um, how did that game happen? It was, uh, it was great. You know, we, uh, again, got to give Coach Sapphire credit because he's working the phones every day. And then I actually jumped on, there's like a message board uh, where you can go to see what teams are looking for what types of games. And I noticed that Iona was looking for a couple games. So I called Jonathan. I said, hey, you got to start, you know, beating down Iona's door. That would be – they were – basically, they were willing to play on the road. So, I called – I said, hey, we got to find a way to get that game in our gym. You know, and we have, we have a little bit of a guarantee budget to work with in terms of buying games to, to bring teams here uh, to the Hilltop. And that was an opponent that – I said, if we can find a way to get opening night with Iona, we're going to be able to get that game on national TV. So, Jonathan reached out to them, got the communication going, and we were able to hammer it home pretty quick. So we're going to be playing Iona either, you know, November 10th or November 11th, the first game of the season. And we've been in constant communication with ESPN to make sure that that game's on TV. But it's, uh, you know, we're always trying to find ways to bring, uh, you know, positive uh, just spotlights on our program. And to be able to get a coach like Rick Pitino, who's going to be a Hall of Famer in our gym on opening night, 
uh, you know, we obviously will feel like we'll be able to, to bring a great crowd to that, to that game. And uh, we should be able to get a lot of national eyeballs on that game as well. Yeah, what was the reaction like? Um, I guess probably not in the office because of our current circumstances, but in, in, on your coaching staff, when you all heard that you had it, you, you got it signed sealed. Uh, everybody's really excited, to be honest. You know, I think uh, everybody understands just, you know, how widely respected Coach Patino is as a coach across college basketball. And for him to come back uh, to the game and go to Iona, uh, again, just to get him in our gym, you know, and, and to be honest, our players are really – knowledgeable about the game and its history and and once they saw that we got that game they were all really excited you know they they understand what it means to get a team like that in our gym and uh you know they're just chomping at the bit now for opening night i think we all are too we all can't wait for that to happen so we talked about iona we talked about the mtes um are there any under the radar matchups for this season that first glance wouldn't seem like a lot but maybe on second glance that would be a game that you would recommend like pay attention to this one yeah absolutely you know I think our our road schedule so far we only have two true road games because we're playing quite a few neutral games uh we're going to Nevada and I think that's going to be a really really tough game and and the reason why we decided to play that game was because we thought that was a great example of what a really tough WCC game would look like you know Nevada had a good year last year they've been really good the previous couple years with Eric Musselman there and uh, again we're going to go up to Reno it's going to be a bus trip we'll get up there and then when we, when we lock horns with them, uh, it's just going to be like a WCC slug match. So we wanted to get that game. That'll be our last game before finals. I think the date's December 2nd. And then, obviously, we, we go to Cal. So we, we go there, uh, which I think is December 13th, to play that game. And then one game that I'm super excited about, uh, we're, we're traveling to Phoenix towards the middle of December to play Grand Canyon University on uh, a neutral floor in Talking Stick Arena, which is where the Phoenix Suns play. And uh, again, Grand Canyon's been a team that, you know, they had a little bit of a dip last year, but the previous couple of years, they were really good. They have a new coach in there now, Bryce Drew, who's going to do a really good job with that program. And to be able to play a team like that on a neutral floor, uh, selfishly, I'm excited about it because that's my hometown. Uh, you know, be able to play in front of, uh, be able to show off our team in front of a lot of friends and family. Um, but those neutral, neutral side games are great. And, and that'll get us ready for the conference tournament, you know, to be able to play a really good opponent on a neutral floor. Uh, will give us the confidence and preparation we need to, to be able to go back and have another good outing once we get to the conference tournament at the end of the season. So, you know, those are a few games that I'm really excited about. Uh, we have Fresno State coming back here to return the home and home that we played down there last year. Southern Illinois as well, they're coming back. Uh, so, the, you know, those are just a few that highlight. We have a couple more games as it is. And uh, this will, as it's shaping out, uh, this will be the most difficult schedule we've had in terms of non-conference games. Uh, since we've been here in our in our five years. I, I want to get back to that in a minute, but I, I do also want to ask about the story behind uh, getting into that neutral site game at, at uh, in Phoenix, because what Gonzaga and BYU are also in from the WCC, and it's all the Arizona teams, right? right. How, how did this thing come about? I mean, it, honestly, it was kind of a long story. There were supposed to be a couple <laughs> different events uh, underneath uh, this one, uh, promoter's umbrella, I guess you would say, one in Phoenix, one in L.A., and something ended up happening where they weren't able to do it in L.A., and so they kind of merged the two events, and I think at, at, at first, the event in Phoenix was supposed to be just two games, us in Grand Canyon uh, and another game, but now, because of that happening in L.A., Gonzaga and, uh, and BYU got moved over to Phoenix with us, and it's going to be just a day of incredible basketball. I think there's four games there that day, starting at 12 noon. Uh, and if you like basketball, I mean, I, I don't know where I'd rather be on December 19th than the uh, Talking Stick Arena. Yeah, quadruple header in the desert when it, you know, you can't cook eggs on a sidewalk, right? So. And, and I think uh, the last game is, is San Diego against NAU. So you got, you got four WCC opponents in that gym on the same day. It'll be pretty neat. Yeah, good preview of the conference schedule right before uh, the conference schedule yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, so y you mentioned um, before – Conference schedule is what it is, right? You use the preseason to, to try and prepare for that. How do you balance the toughest schedule that you've had in your time here in non-conference or um, a lighter schedule, just get wins under your belt, get your confidence up? Yeah, it's, I think it's, you got to take a look at your team before every season. You know, uh, basically, as soon as your season ends, <clears throat> this becomes something that you're thinking about internally. And you have, to have a, you have to have a good pulse on your program and on your team. And, no, you know, if you're, if you're a little younger and inexperienced, 
uh, and you haven't, you don't have a lot of guys that you feel like have the confidence to be successful, you might want to build it out a little softer early and try to manufacture some wins and manufacture some confidence and, and get them playing with some freedom and confidence. But uh, for this team, even though we are going to be pretty young, we do have enough returning where I feel like our guys are going to be able to, to carry some of the younger guys early in the year. And, uh, you know, we have a really experienced backcourt, which I think sets us up nicely. So we're, we're going to go for it. You know, we're going to try to give ourselves a situation with our schedule where if, if we are successful, that we're set up to be an NCAA tournament team. And the only way you can do that is by taking some chances and uh, putting yourself in a position where you might not win the games. But if you do, then, then you're in really good shape, you know, and, and that will – give you a little bit of a higher ceiling than just uh, beating up on some low major opponents that, that aren't very good. So that, that's kind of the mentality that we took going into the season. Uh, the guys returning in our program have, have earned the opportunity to really go for it. And uh, I, I think they're confident enough to, you know, when we go see an Arkansas or we go on the road to Cal, you know, they, they know they belong and they're going to perform really well. You mentioned that the guys on the team were excited when they heard about the Iona game. Um, were they all, did you also get similar reactions for the MTE, for the Grand Canyon, for those really tough games that you keep talking about? Absolutely. I, you know, when we, we talk to our guys about it when we meet with them weekly about different games that we've added to the schedule or what we have. And uh, I think it's one of their favorite parts of our meetings to kind of figure out and learn who we're playing. And uh, I know a bunch of the guys uh, in our program were really excited for the MTE. Uh, you know, the opportunity to go to Vegas and play a team like Arkansas, like I said, is something that, that's really unique and not every team gets to do that. And then if, uh, if we are able to be successful, then we get a crack at Louisville or Colorado State. Again, two really good programs. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're really excited, and, and they, they can't wait to get on the floor with those guys. The WCC schedule is Thursday, Saturday, Thursday, Saturday, a couple of off days in here. Um, non-conference is all over the place. Yep. You know, when you're doing a non-conference schedule, do you try and, and mimic as much as possible that kind of grind they'll be in January through early March? Or is it – more just get the games in. It's a little bit more just get the games in. <laughs> you know, I think it's, just, it's so difficult because every team is building their own schedule, right? So a team might have one date available that, that you have, but then a couple other dates that you have, they don't. So you might have to say, all right, we just got to bite the bullet and play the game in that, in that date. And then you're constantly juggling. And like I said, you know, with this being an election year, the season's starting a little bit later than it normally does. With WCC starting on December 31st, we really have to pack in 15 games in a tight time frame with about a week or so uh, that we can't use at the beginning of December because of finals. You know, we're not, we're not playing in finals. So um, at this point, you know, we want to give ourselves enough time to recalibrate and refresh in between contests, but sometimes you, you can't avoid it. For example, last year, you know, we played Arizona State and Cal back-to-back, -back, you know, back-to-back -back days. It, less than ideal, trust me. But <laughs> to get those two Pac-12 opponents in our gym, I, I would have played them on the same day. You know, you, you got to play those games. You, those games are so hard to find um, that, that we were willing to do that. And fortunately, we were able to bounce back quickly off that Arizona State game to beat Cal. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's tough. And, again, when you get a good game, you got to figure out a way to get it on your schedule and then work around it. Your team has success on the court. We talked about last time your team's success in the classroom. D does that factor into scheduling at all, uh, classroom success? Yeah, absolutely. I think it gives us a little more freedom in regards to when we can play games and when we can travel. Uh, our guys have proven that they're capable of, of doing a great job in the classroom when they're on the road. Um, you know, we're doing mandatory study hall on the road. We occasionally are allowed to bring our uh, academic coordinator to, to just help the guys uh, when they're not allowed or not able to be around their teachers. Uh, but because of that continued success, I know it gives my administration a lot of confidence that, hey, if these guys miss a day or two of class here, it's okay. You know, they're going to, they'll be right back in class the next morning. And, you know, they've done a good job ever since they've been here. So I trust that they're going to be able to shoulder that load. And uh, it, it definitely gives us a little bit more flexibility. And if we were, if we were worried about our guys in the classroom, every second of the day, it, it, would be, it would be tough to travel in the non-conference. It would be tough to do some of these things that their academic performance allows us to do. Do the relationships you've built through your time in college basketball help you get some good non-conference opponents? Sometimes. You know, I, I was working Bruce pretty hard this year to see if, uh, <laughs> if he would play the Dons. And, uh, you know, and just transparently, they're going to they're have a young team, and I think he uh, – nobody respects our program more than he does. And, 
and he was he was honest and he just didn't want to play us this year. <laughs> but, uh, I respect that honesty, I guess. Um, but sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, you just you just hope that you get those opportunities and, and keep those conversations open. And, and, you know, our past relationships and past coaches that we worked for, you know, keep an eye out for us, like Coach Mike Magpio down at Riverside, who's a great friend. He worked with us as ops a couple years ago. You know, we're always trying to help each other out. Like, hey, I heard – uh, so-and-so school might need a game. Why don't you give them a call? And he does the same for us. So when you have enough allies, you know, it usually works out pretty well. That's actually great that you mentioned Auburn. That was one of our fan questions of the week is when is that happening? So I guess TBA um, for that one. But, yeah, I think, you know, we, uh, uh, I'll keep pushing Bruce every year. I think uh, <laughs> now that it's been enough time now that, that I've been gone from there and uh, you know, not, none of the players that I was a part of recruiting are still there. So you know, I think if they have a if they have a solid year this year, I think we will be able to get back on the schedule with them for the for the following year. And uh, uh, this year was just a little too hard with everything going on. But next year, if if I have to beg, I'll beg, and I, I think we'll be able to get it done. The other question, and it would relate to this, and also really to when you have uh, your conference schedule as well. You have some some big hitters on your schedule, and you also have some games that will fall into that quad three, quad four. And when those come up back to back against each other, how do you get the guys to to not look past those quad three, quad four games? It's 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 a fair question. I think uh, it's it's a little wider than that from the standpoint of it's really just kind of our environment of our program where we we just compete in nearly everything we do. So I'm not I'm not a super rah rah guy in the locker room before games. You know I, I expect our guys to to bring the same performance and the same level of focus and intensity, whether we're playing Gonzaga or Sonoma state. Now that's not always the case, right? I mean, we're, you're not, we're not getting that consistently amazing effort 100% of the time, but that's what we're striving for. Uh, and again, I think with that, having that understanding that when you have slip ups, it's really, really difficult to make the NCAA tournament. Uh, I, our, our guys understand the gravity of each and every game. So um, we, we, if we feel like we have to light a fire, we might do that. But these guys are pretty good self-starters, and, and for the most part of the past few years have proven that uh, they're going to bring a great effort every night. Well, we're looking forward to those great efforts this year. I'm, I'm sure I speak for all of Don's Nation uh, when I say that. Awesome. That's all the questions I have for you this week. Uh, anything else on scheduling that, that we missed? No, I think, I think it was a great conversation, and uh, it's just a, it's an ever-changing landscape. It's a nonstop <laughs> Uh, project that we continue to work on and uh, you know again I just want to make sure people understand like coach Jonathan Sapphire does a wonderful job you know he's uh, he's our director of ops and uh, I've tasked him with really putting this schedule together and we, and we work hand in hand on it but uh, he's the one in the trenches every day digging on this so I can focus on you know making sure our team is ready to go and is as squared away as they need to be so he does a wonderful job and, and he's a big part of why we're able to have such a good schedule. Well, thank you, Coach, and thank you, uh, John, for, for your work on the schedule this year. I, I'm, I'm excited for the full release and then excited for the WCC schedule when that comes out. All right, this has been the Golden Hour with USF men's basketball head coach Todd Golden. Uh, for Coach Golden, I am Vinny Longo. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to tune in again next Friday at noon. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and go Dons.